Hello my lovelies and welcome, welcome, welcome to today's video. My name's Ali and I'm so glad you stopped by. Today we're talking all about orthoptics. Uh, a lot of the time I get asked, isn't your job a bit boring? Do you do this every day, all day? Isn't that going to be repetitive if you're doing it all day long? And I'm here to tell you the answer is no. My job is anything but boring and I'd love to tell you a little bit more about what I do every day. So stick around if you'd like to find out more. I think today's topic is an interesting one because I get asked so frequently about what an orthoptist does, you know, or what do you do all day? Is it this all day? Are you just going better one or two all day? Can't, don't you find this repetitive? No, and that's not what I do all day. Every single patient has different needs and I'm constantly on my toes. It's been at least 11 years that I'm doing this exact particular role um, and I'm not bored. I'm really not bored. I don't think I've ever gone a day that I haven't come across someone with something new or had to think really hard about something or really had to challenge my, um, you know, sort of my real deep dark knowledge that I haven't visited for seven or eight years because I haven't seen it since back then. Um, you know, it's definitely always keeping me, keeping me thinking, definitely that much. What's really fantastic about, I think any health profession is that when you're dealing with people, you're never going to get the same thing twice. People are fiercely individual fiercely different even twins will have some sort of differences between them and we do have twins at the clinic um you know we perhaps don't see them at the same time and they're perhaps you know a little bit older so life got in the way at some stage but we definitely do see um siblings and twins um and they they just have very different needs um and that's perfectly understandable what we definitely do keep um reminding people though is that if they they have relatives they are at risk of certain diseases. Um, so a lot of the things can be repetitive. And one thing that definitely can sometimes get a bit mundane, um, as an orthoptist, I don't do exclusively eye tests for glasses. I, I do them for a lot of my patients, but definitely not all, at least not every visit. Um, often they come with prescriptions from the optometrist already, um, and all I have to do is make sure that it's current and correct and all that sort of stuff, but I don't really have to start from scratch like an optometrist would have to in order to prescribe glasses. All I, gotta, all I have to do is make sure that their eye is functioning at its best capability. My biggest repetition comes with photography. So medical imaging of the retina happens with either optics or lasers or a combination of the two. The machine I will use the most in my practice is an OCT. I've spoken about it before um, on this channel. It's an optical coherence tomographer, which is literally what it's saying. It's using optics, in my case, a laser optics, or a very concentrated beam of light, to measure and map out in 3D um, the different layers of the retina and tell me what's going on there on a cellular level. So it sounds really fancy and it kind of is, um, but really the technology hasn't ta changed a terrible amount in the 10 years that I've worked on it or nine years that I've worked on it. Um, since it came out, it, they keep on refreshing the software, which is really important because from a statistical point of view and how we interpret and extrapolate is really important and that's changed. We've learned a lot, but the actual photography itself, you'll notice it with your mobile phone. There hasn't actually been that much change in the last X amount of years. It's kind of been a bit sort of on a plateau. Um, they kind of did it really well at the beginning, so they haven't really had to ch have to change it too much. But having said that, yes, OCTs do get repetitive, but even though the actual process of doing the OCTs, and unfortunately I actually have to manually save them where I work, which we're working on, we're working on changing that. What I actually learn from the OCTs and what I actually have to then extrapolate from the information or the data that I've collected, especially if they're patients that have come back, so they've had previous OCTs done by the machine that I'm working on or by me, I can actually do a follow-up. The important thing about a follow-up is it allows me to compare that patient in the past to that patient in the present. So I'm no longer just pulling statistics out of the sky, or at least the machine's not. I'm now actually comparing that patient to themselves in a further point in time. Sounds pretty straightforward, but actually it's so unbelievably important. Think about any blood test that your doctor's ever done or any measurement your doctor's ever done, your weight, your height, your feelings, your, any kind of history your, your doc, any of your doctors have ever collected on you and how they then use it going down the line, further in, down the track. And how just absolutely invaluable that is. It's priceless. Um, 
being able to see how an individual is changing rather than just guessing based on some statistic. And we enter age, gender, and um, a little bit about ethnic background, but only if it's really obvious, like Asian, for example, or, um, you know, that's pretty much it, or Caucasian. That's pretty much the only time you can really define it. Everybody else is a little bit of a mixture of something, right? So you can't really know that much about somebody's genetic background unless they've had it screened. Somebody can actually tell you, I'm 100%, X, Y, Z, and then I'll put it in. But the machine itself doesn't have that kind of data necessarily. So often looking at that person, say 2018, and then today, three years down the track, really interesting. I can see how different um, bits of scar tissue or different changes or different deposits or different vessels have deteriorated or not deteriorated over that time. Very significantly so is a disease that we very boringly monitor, and that is glaucoma. Glaucoma requires a field test, which is a completely subjective test done by the patient. The patient just responds to flashes of light spoken about um, fields on this channel. And after they've responded to those flashes of light, we then have to interpret how their vision pattern works. Usually straightforward, sometimes can be complicated when there are some sort of deteriorations there. Then we take a picture on that OCT where we map out the thickness of the cells, see if they've deteriorated, see if those two match. Then we also take a photo of the nerve to see if there's any hemorrhages or any kind of changes there. We also do a whole bunch of other testing in between in the chair, which is your vision, your pressure, other things, other measurements. Um, corneal thickness sometimes, sometimes color vision, sometimes you know saturations and things like that. It can get quite complicated if you let it. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're actually looking for is any kind of minute change. Any kind of minute change will either lead us to understand that there are other complicated issues or that glaucoma is actually progressing. The problem with glaucoma is it may not even be glaucoma. The differential diagnosis can be as li a list as long as your arm. And sometimes glaucoma is misdiagnosed, even today. Sometimes they have something slightly different going on. The treatment is way different. Um, and yet they've been treated like they have an ocular disease this whole time and actually maybe it's neurological in nature and it's often my job to choose what tests to do and in which order to do them in in order to get that accuracy in the room. So no, even the most boring and most tedious tests or diseases are still keeping you on your toes. I have been in the situation three times that I can remember recently where I've actually proven that someone's glaucoma isn't quite such a simple thing. We've also had a case probably not even a month ago where we're treating this person for ocular hypertension, the classic glaucoma where the pressures are high in the eye. By the way, if you want to learn more about glaucoma, I had to have a video about it. And then it wasn't. It was actually an old neurological change to the optic nerve and something else has developed since and it's all this complicated stuff and you know I'd never seen it all happen in one patient at the same time before um, and it was a really interesting complex situation um, you know or I had another patient the other day which just swore to me black and blue that how could she have migraines I'm sitting there thinking what you're describing to me sounds a lot like a migraine and I did some tests to show that in fact it was a migraine and I sort of said, look, doctor might send you for more testing, but I'm pretty confident that that's what we're dealing with here and gave us some tips and had a conversation and all the things. And then at the end of the day, I discussed it with doctor and it was in fact migraine. She had a long history of migraine many years back, but just sort of not only failed to inform me, but also denied it when I suggested it. So, you know, you get all, all sorts. It constantly keeps you on your toes. I do sometimes get a little bit underwhelmed with OCT because you kind of time to time, I think because I've been doing it for such a while, you lose sight of the fact that you're, like you measure the same thing over and over, right? So when you're measuring the same thing over and over, it gets a little bit sort of, I don't know, mundane, I guess. But I am constantly reminding myself that if it's mundane, it means we're doing the right thing by our patients. Our patients are not deteriorating. You know, we sometimes are able to extend the time between visits if they're so stable, which is exciting for the patient both from the health point of view, but also to their hip pocket. Um, you know, it's just, there's a lot of things to keep you humble in, in a job like mine. Um, and just, I also find that just as I keep, catch myself thinking, oh, another refraction today, which is like an eye test for glasses. Why are these people seeing their optometrist? Or, you know, I start to have these thoughts of sort of where I'm not being grateful. Believe me, the second I have that thought, the next pers person that walks through the door is so challenging, so new, so different. And I almost feel 
sad that I can't help them as much because what they have is a little bit too complicated for my skill set or whatever it is. It always works out for the best. I'm, you know, lucky that way I work with a fantastic doctor in a really, really great clinic and we have a great network um, of people with um, subspecialties to refer to if we need to. It's it's really quite quite a great setup. But it's just that you can never really be too confident because the fact is that every single human is going to require a different skill set. Now, if it's not with the imaging, then it's going to be with your character or your approach. As I mentioned, that lady with the um, migraines, she had no idea. She's a little bit elderly. She may have forgotten or she may not have understood what I was going on about or whatever the case. But it really does take that teamwork to be able to communicate to the patient. Um, sometimes that's where the challenge lies. It's not about how good you are at taking photos or measuring scripts or anything like that. At the end of the day, sometimes it's just your approach and how friendly you are or how confident you are or how humble you are or how little you say or maybe sometimes how much you say and just judging every individual with their needs and providing those needs. And sometimes it's about not doing all the tests because the patient can't afford it and choosing the ones that are the most pivotal and that's a skill set in itself. Um, you know, that's, that's something I had to learn really the hard way um, in practice because I think I must have been a bit spoiled as a child. We never had much, um, you know, my parents are migra migrants, so we never really had an abundance of money or anything, but I was never denied, definitely not medical attention anyway. Um, so, the, you know, I had to really understand that some people have different priorities, like they literally won't be putting food on the table if they want to have private um, medical exams. And I had to learn that even though I was quite adult when I started and I probably understood that in my head, but I never necessarily understood it practically or had never witnessed it on a practical level until I saw it, until it was right in front of me, staring me in my face time and time again, you know, and you have to sort of learn that some people are not straightforward with their mental health. And that's something that you have to learn to sort of decipher and deal with and approach as well. The other thing is I, learned this at uni like there was definitely well, there was a lecturer or a guest speaker or every single clinician every single health worker has to know what their boundaries they all of us will have one type of patient we cannot see her example was that she could never see somebody who was involved with um you know illegal behaviors towards children we'll put it that way um just pg rating for this purpose um so you can use your imagination what she might have been alluding to um, and I kind of went, oh, I could never work with that. But I realized that, especially after having kids as well, um, there was so much more to what I can and can't work with. And surprisingly, I can work with quite a lot that I never thought I could. And I can't work with a lot where I th thought I could. So, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting learning curve. You're constantly growing and changing as a person as well. And depending where you are in your own heart and in your own journey, that will also change the kind of kind of game you bring to your professional world, the kind of clinician you become. Like there were definitely times um, over the last whatever it was amount of years from when I was dispensing, where I was working in retail aspect of optics and to now where I'm a clinician and I'm one-on-one -on -one in a room with people and all the empathy you have to give there, where I've changed. There were definitely days or situations where I just didn't have it. I just couldn't give it. It just wasn't there. Um, and I don't necessarily even regret it. It's just where I was at the time and that's where my experience was. And having had those moments or those days or those periods of time where I just couldn't lend as much understanding to people as perhaps I can today helped me grow into the person I am and into the journey as a human being that I've then gone on. You know, it, it always, always strikes me how lucky we are in Melbourne especially, probably one of the most unlucky cities lately, but medically speaking, we're so lucky here. We have an abundance of fantastic clinicians, fantastic optometrists, fantastic doctors and surgeons. We also have a wonderful free medical service for eye and ear. We have the Royal Eye and Ear Hospital. We also have just down the road from the eye and ear, we have the Alfred Hospital, which is a general public hospital, which also has a fantastic ophthalmic department. Um, and yeah, there are waiting lists and yeah, it's not always fair, but it's free. The fact that anybody, given enough time, can easily access world-class, fantastic, successful um, eye procedures and eye surgery is amazing. We also have Monash, which is a little bit in the other direction, sort of southeast. But 
the fact is we have Sandringham, we have a lot, a lot of places where you can receive bulk build or Medicare or government sponsored treatment for the eyes. And I think that is such a gift um, that that is something that we are able to do in this country. And there are doctors that will run special clinics, we do, um, where there is a particular service, a particular treatment, let's say, that's available for a particular disease, which is perhaps, you know, hard to handle in the public system. For us, it's macular degeneration treatment. We do that bulk build once a fortnight, once a month, depending what's going on. Um, because that's something that's overwhelming the public system at the moment and we had the capacity to help out so we did so there are certain things available out there um, so never be afraid to ask your clinician what's available they might know and they might put you onto something that's more suitable for you I think having that rapport and having that conversation with your patients or with your clinicians depending which chair you're sitting in is so so wonderful and you should never be shy to ask um, you will not be judged you don't people don't go into healthcare to judge people people go into healthcare to help people so i've just finished off my look with a bit of green and teal um, i hope you enjoyed a little chat today um, i really really hope that more people out there choose orthoptics as their career i think it's a wonderful career and i think that people don't get to see the whole picture during their visits there are so many aspects there are so many aspects to what an orthoptist does and also can do. I think that what I have clinically is actually quite limited um, to the big, bigger potential because I work at such a small clinic, but I love it. And it, like I said, it keeps me definitely on my toes every single day, even after all these years. Um, so, you know, if you work at a place that has more variety than all the more for you, there's definitely orthoptists that also do surgery or help out in surgery, do minor procedures, do different treatments. Um, also, you know, there are orthoptists that deal with pediatrics and deal with all the kids stuff and those clinics are often independent. You know, the sky's the limit. Um, allied health is just such a broad thing, no matter who you are. Um, and it is what you make it. And I happen to prefer geriatric health or adult health. So that's where I'm in. But, and I love the doctor I work with, so that's what it is. But, you know, there are definitely choices and there's definitely different career paths that people take. If you did enjoy today's video, aside from researching orthoptics further, I hope you do hit the big like button. Subscribe if you haven't done already. That big red button, please do turn it grey. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to already, pop over onto Instagram where there's more stuff going on um, every day. I'd love to see you there. Leave me a comment, whether it's here on Instagram, um, and say hello. And wherever you are around the world, I hope you're having an amazing day. You're staying safe and healthy. And I can't wait to see you on the next one. Bye. Spare bubbles, spare bubbles, spare bubbles, spare bubbles.